Hello, I'm Dr. Jay McCartney. I'm a psychologist in the UK and have worked in the criminal behavioural field for many years. In these videos, I wanted to look a little bit behind the headlines at the, the motivations, the psychology of the crime, the psychology of the, the criminals, the murderers, the serial killers, just to get a little bit more insight into why they committed the crimes that they did. So before I start, if I could get you to subscribe, hit the bell below and you'll know exactly when another Psychology of Crime video comes along. So today I wanted to look at Dennis Rader. Now he's a serial killer known globally across the world. Now he's very unusual in a serial killer because his crimes went on for such a long time. He, he conducted his known crimes or his attributed crimes through the 70s, 80s and just into the 90s. But he wasn't caught until the early 2000s. And I'll come to that a little bit later, exactly how he got caught. And literally it is hoisted by your own stupidity in his case. So let's go back a little bit and let's just look at a few key incidents in his life. And what I want to do is give you potentially what his thoughts and behaviour may have been around those times. Now, obviously, I haven't interviewed him. I don't think he's done any interviews, unlike some killers that there have been. So this is just kind of me putting my professional experience onto what my idea and my supposition about his thoughts may have been. So if we go back to, he was, when obviously he came out and he, he became um, a known figure, what tends to happen is lots of people from that person's background and that person's childhood will come forward with their stories about him. And one of the stories that came about was, was his want to torture and kill animals. I'm not going to go into the details because they're just horrible and horrendous. But this isn't uncommon, as in when they're children, as to what they they will do. So there's there's this thing called the McDonald, I think it is, triad, that they look at a killer in their past and they're looking for three things, obviously being a triad. Uh, they're looking for torturing of animals, they're looking for bedwetting, and they're looking for fire starting. And these, they say, if they're these three things are in a child's life, not that they're necessarily going to go on to be a serial killer, but they potentially could have certain attributes that serial killers have. It's been a little bit, not exactly debunked, but it's been a little bit questioned over the years, but certainly torturing of and, and killing of, of animals is one of the things that is fairly high on the list and it is quite prevalent in a lot of killers. So yes, the people would come out of the uh, Dennis Rader's background and they would say, yes, he had a propensity and a want to kill animals. Now he would watch them suffering. Now, that is an important thing because there is a thrill attached to that. There is a thrill attached to the control that you, even as a small child, has over that animal. You are dismissive of their pain. You are impervious to what distress they may be going through and also the distress of people around you. I find it always a little bit curious that when you get these people that come out of people's backgrounds and say, oh yes, he did this, he would do all these terrible things why the hell didn't they do anything about it you know as small children themselves they may have been scared of him or didn't want to do anything but why didn't they tell an adult I'm always just quite curious as to why that doesn't happen but seemingly this happens a lot and a lot of people don't then tell their parents or authority figures that this person is being cruel to animals but anyway so yes, he would do that. And what he would have been thinking at that time was, I have control of you. I have complete and utter control of you. You're only an animal, you're easily dismissed, and you're probably going to die anyway. So I'm just quickening that, but I have the control over you. And I find that absolutely thrilling. It's potentially the first time in my life that I've found and I've felt this, I've found this and I've felt this and I like it and I want to repeat it. And this is often what happens as they, they grow older. That Some killers will carry on being torturous and horrible to animals, but other killers have been known, you know, this is where they move on to other people. And he would kill his first victims, um, a, a family of four in the early 70s. Now, again, what would he have been thinking at that point? He would have been thinking he would have put all this kind of animal torture onto humans and he would have just been very dismissive of them. He was the powerful one. They were the weak one. There was four of them. They couldn't 
undermine him. They couldn't overpower him. They were weak. They were vulnerable. They were stupid. They were practically asking for what he did to them. Add to that the thrill that he's getting. And again, throughout the research that I've read about him, he would have been getting a sexual thrill, which he would have been associated, his sexual thrill, with these killings. And of course, that's why serial killers become serial killers because they want to repeat that. They want to repeat the thrill and the interest and those feelings that they get. And that's why he would have, throughout the 70s and 80s, this is what he, he would do. Now, the interesting thing that we come on to with Raider, and of course this is well known, was his communications, his communications with uh, a local newspaper, with a local TV, radio stations, all the things that he was doing to kind of tell the authorities, the police, the FBI, how stupid they were because he was too clever for them. He was leaving clues in library books and, and what have you. He was telling them who he was, but he he, he wasn't kind of telling them, who, obviously, who he was because they would have caught him, but they were telling them that there was a serial killer out there. And also, he wanted to brand himself. He is known as the BKT, the Blind Kill and Torture Serial Killer. And it's interesting, he gave himself that, that moniker, that name, because he wanted to, I believe, up the ante. If you think about notorious serial killers, you know, the, the granddad of them all, if you like, Jack the Ripper. Now, to people, Ripper, what does that mean? It could mean a few things, but it's not very obvious what it means. You have Son of Sam, the Zodiac Killer, that was obviously given by the, the press, etc, etc. But he wanted to be in control of the name that he gave his crimes. And it has been kind of argued that it's almost like it was like a dual personality, because throughout his entire life, he was able to maintain... Um, a, a fairly okay military career, from what I can gather, a relationships, having children, jobs, a reasonable position in his local church. And these were the things that people have kind of said, well, he was Dennis Raider in those situations. And then did he have a multiple personality and become the the serial killer, the BKT serial killer in these. And, and I don't think he did, but that's what I believe he wanted people to believe. Because with all killers, no matter how clever they think they are and how evasive they are and prove to be to themselves that they are evasive and to the authorities, there's always just that tiny bit of them that believes they may get caught. And they're just kind of banking stuff for the future. OK, I, I might be able to rely on that as a defence, that I was a, you know, I was having multiple personalities, I was a paranoid schizophrenic or, or anything that I can rely on to excuse my crimes. And we'll come to his court appearances a little bit later because they're very interesting as well. So he would be sending these communications um, and he would be... There was one particular incident where he was waiting for somebody to come back to a house and he was really genuinely annoyed at them not becoming one of his victims because his MO apparently was to pick victims, to stalk them, to... You know, they were prey to him like the animals... If we, if we go back to his childhood, they would just pray to him. And he was really cross that this one particular victim didn't become a victim. And you, you can see it in his communication, how annoyed he is, how genuinely annoyed he is, because he can only see things from his point of view. He's got classic narcissistic traits that he can only see things from his point of view. And he wanted it out there, and this is not uncommon for serial killers, he wanted his crimes out there because there is no point being this, you know, high-end serial killing genius if nobody knows about it. So you put it out there, you let them know. Now, it all went very quiet um, after the... The, the late the late 80s, early 90s. And what I found particularly interesting was that he kind of just... January time, he did his last killing that was attributed to him. And what's interesting is that I, I find that that's about the time that Silence of the Lambs came out, the film Silence of the Lambs came out, which I'm loath to say glamorised serial killing, but it certainly put killers killing their psychology on the map and on the interest of a lot of people. And I think my personal thoughts are Raider got 
cross about that because it was literally only a few weeks before that film came out that his last victim was killed. And I think he had to kind of take a back step because suddenly there was all this interest in killers and he was this super killer as far as he was concerned. But people might have started to put two and two together. So he took a back step for a good 20 years. And in the early 2000s, his want to become known again to reignite the interest in him became too much for him and again that thrill that he got from evading capture that thrill that he got from not only the killings but that thrill that he got from tormenting the authorities was just getting too much for him and again he just wanted to let the world know what a clever boy he was what a evasive and clever and domineering and powerful and superior being he was he couldn't resist that and that that was the thing as I said before that he you know he, he got hoisted by his hoisted by his own stupidity because apparently he was in contact with I can't remember if it's the police or the FBI and he made some kind of contact to say oh if I send you some something on a floppy disk does that mean that you won't be able to find out any more details about it I would say you're, you're practically asked to being being found and arrested. And of course, they answer the question to say, no, of course not. Of course, we won't be able to read anything more into this bit of computer equipment. Obviously, he wasn't very computer au fait. Otherwise, he, he wouldn't have done that. So he duly sends the floppy disk. They find out some details about his church and some letters that he'd written on their behalf or something. They managed to put two and two and got some DNA evidence from that and from his daughter. And anyway, he was arrested. He didn't ever believe that that was going to happen. He said there was a tiny bit, as I said before, there's this kind of half a percent that maybe thinks, oh, I'll just bank some stuff for the future. But really, I don't, you know, I've evaded you for 40 years. You're not going to catch up with me now. I'm too clever for you. So he really didn't believe that was going to happen. And it was interesting because at his court appearances, so he was convicted, uh, well, he, he admitted the, the murder of 10 people and then he was duly jailed. But he was, at his court, he made an apology. He made an apology to the victims. He wasn't in any way, shape or form, apologising to the victims or the victim's family. He was apologising on behalf of himself. He was trying to lessen his sentence. He was trying to get an easier time in jail. I don't know, but he certainly was not apologising on behalf of the victims or to the victims or the families of the victims. He, as a classic narcissist, as a classic narcissistic serial killer, was thinking 100% about himself, which he had done all the time. So those are my thoughts about what Dennis Rader would have been thinking at these key moments. Obviously, there's a lot to his story and, you know, a welcome, yeah, I would say, Google it, have a look at, at his backstory. But those are sort of like four areas, important parts of his life, where I'm just attributing what I think, from a pre professional and experience point of view, his thoughts may have been. And it comes down to, why did he kill? Because he wanted the attention. He wanted the sexual thrill, but he wanted the attention. And that was probably equally as important to him. You know, if he hadn't been this terrible, awful killer then people wouldn't have taken any notice of him. So, of course, he had to up the ante and to keep himself in the spotlight. And that's what he wanted. He wanted the attention. His background was he was the oldest of four children, pretty straightforward, pretty normal. I've read some reports that say that it was abusive, but then I've read other reports that say it was pretty straightforward. There was nothing particular about it. But what would have happened being one of four, he would have not got, he would have got, potentially the quarter of the attention or he would have got no attention because mum's favourite was the last one or something I don't know but in his mind he had a deficit of attention but also if we put into his born psychopathy and I'm going to say that because as a young child you don't go around torturing and abusing animals if you have a normal way of thinking and a normal way of being. So put those things together and this is what you what you, you get with Dennis Rader. And then throughout his entire career, his killing career, but also his, his regular career, he's able to 
what he believes be in control, which he was, and that was validated, of course, because he wasn't caught for a long time and it was only by his own stupidity and grandioseness that he was caught. And you have somebody that really, truly believes in his own legend, the legend that he has created, of course. So those are my thoughts on Dennis Radar. If I can ask you to subscribe and share and all the things that it, and the things that the um, YouTube algorithm likes to do, and also just to let you know, I have also a accompanying podcast called Why Killers Kill, which is on all the usual platforms, and there I look at some killings and some crimes in a little bit more detail as well. So thanks ever so much for watching, and I will be along shortly with another Psychology of Crime, and until then. Bye.